So Dr. Emily Borgmeyer is going to be presenting today, was with us for a perioperative medicine fellowship a couple of years ago, had done her residency and an advanced ECHO fellowship at University of Utah, which I would say for ECHO is one of the premier, if not the premier place uh, in the country, if not the world to go get training. So today she's going to talk to us about perioperative point of care ultrasound uh, for lung assessment. Um, and because she was one of our fellows, I always take the time to remember people, uh, remind people there are a bunch of fellowships out there in perioperative medicine. We have one. Would love for you to apply, but there's also a number of good ones uh, at other places. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Um, so big thank you for having me back. It's always a privilege to come back and be invited to talk somewhere where I trained and learned so much from the folks who are there. Um, I'm sure, you know, we got the periop room there. Um, so what I want to talk about today is lung ultrasound for folks who are doing perioperative care. So in the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative context, um, I tried to cram quite a bit in. So this is kind of like lung ultrasound 101, 201, and like a little bit of 301. So um, there's a lot going on, but I'll try to pause every once in a while and um, ask for questions if you guys have any. I do not have any disclosures other than the fact that I have no shame about telling you how awesome it is to live and work in Utah. Um, Matt's outside right now. We're getting, I think we have three feet of snow falling today. So it's, uh, it's gonna be a, a good winter. All right, so I wanna start off by saying that um, as we all know, ultrasound is a super powerful tool, whether you're doing blocks, cardiac echo or lung ultrasound. Um, we as anesthesiologists need tool belts, full tool belts that we know, know how to use to answer critical clinical questions. Like why might my patient be hypoxic in the OR or short of breath in the PACU with respect to lung ultrasound? Um, with any ultrasound modality, I think that, you know, it's a very powerful tool, but there's a lot of responsibility when you use that tool. So it's important to practice a lot, know your stuff and use those tools responsibly. And by that, I mean, it's okay to say, I don't know, I need a second set of eyes or have a backup way to look and do an assessment if you're not sure of your exam. Lung ultrasound is also becoming more important because for the residents, it is also on um, an increasing amount of tests. So it is now part of the ABA oral boards OSCE section as of last year. Um, and then it's also been incorporated into the residency milestones uh, with the ACGME. And it's expected that anesthesiology residents should now graduate and be able to use point of care ultrasound or POCUS to detect a pneumothorax or a, and pleural effusion. So what else do we need to know about lung ultrasound before jumping in? I think the thousand foot view of some advantages and disadvantages of lung ultrasound um, is appropriate. I think lung ultrasound is a quick exam. It's fairly reliable. Um, it exposes the patient to less radiation and less danger with transportation like to a CT scanner or to chest x-ray um, as, you know, as that has to happen. I also think it's an advantage to have it be a dynamic exam. Um, I also listed dynamic and the disadvantages because I think there is um, a tendency to take a look, make or exclude a diagnosis, and then as a patient's situation changes, re not remember that you can repeat that exam. So it's good that it's dynamic because we can keep taking looks, um, but we also forget that it's dynamic sometimes. Um, the other kind of disadvantage is that there is some provider variability, both with image acquisition and interpretation, um, but we can decrease that as we um, learn more and practice more. So I put all these on here, these signs and you know um, acronyms and things like that to show you that I feel like lung ultrasound is actually pretty overwhelming at first, especially when you're early on in residency and just starting to learn about ultrasound. Um, it's yeah, just not uncommon to feel overwhelmed with this, but I wanna have you guys stick with me today. We are actually gonna go through all of these and hopefully make, make them make sense and um, remember exactly what all these are. So we're gonna talk about some pretty basic physics talk about how we acquire images with lung ultrasound, um, outline a couple of imaging protocols so that we can work on standardizing our exam. And then the bulk of the talk really is in specific findings and images that we're gonna make and see, and then talk about some clinical context and some pitfalls that I feel like we all should be aware of when we're using this. I put physics on here kind of lightly almost. This is like a thousand foot view of um, kind of the ultrasound of the, the fact. And why that is, um, 
is because it's a little bit different than like regular cardiac echo or visceral echo. With regular echo, we're sending those high frequency sound waves into tissue, which are mostly water. And so that ultrasound sound wave is transmitted fairly well. Um, and then it's reflected based on changes in the tissue um, density or changes in impedance. And that's how that's, that image is made. When we compare that to lung ultrasound and you think about what lung is normally, lung is typically air, which has high impedance. So we talk about that because that means most of the sound that we send into that tissue is actually reflected at the pleural interface. And so we're not seeing much below the pleural interface normally. Um, and so what we're gonna talk about today is an interpretation of a lot of artifacts so that we can understand what we're seeing. I think it's also important to include in the physics portion of this, um, how we choose a probe, because there's a very basic concept in ultrasound that the higher a frequency, the higher uh, frequency probe will image better superficially. And then the lower frequency probes are better at deeper imaging. Um, you can see that I've outlined and tried to label just in case you're not familiar with what, um, what each probe is. Um, the linear probe is a high frequency probe that's better at imaging in the near field. The phased array probe um, is the one that we're often, you know, we have most readily available. And it has pretty good depth of imaging, but also with fairly good image resolution. And so it can be used kind of dynamically for all parts of the exam, which is nice. Cause like I said, it's usually the probe that most of us have, have available. Um, and then the curvilinear or the convex probe is a pretty low frequency probe. And so is primarily gonna be your best for imaging deeper um, and posterior on the chest. While we're talking about um, probe choice, I think it's, interesting to talk about handheld devices. Um, I don't think that Vanderbilt, you guys have handheld devices, but a lot of other institutions are using them. So if we pick up and use a handheld device for these lung images, is that gonna be good enough? I, so there was one prospective observational trial that looked at a really small end to be fair, but tried to do a standardized exam where they gave a score based on the image. And, when comparing the standard echo machine versus the handheld, there was a similar score obtained between groups. So I think based on like very early, early kind of data, it's probably okay to use our handheld devices for these lung, lung exams. They're not always the most perfect image, but they seem to do the job okay. Hey, Emily, sorry to interrupt just because we're currently mm -hmm. considering, Ted and I are trying to push towards getting more probes. Do, do you know which of the handhelds that was? It, or do you think it really matters? You know, I couldn't say. I don't know which one that was. I, I bet it wouldn't really matter. I honestly don't. There's only a few out there and they're using similar software. Um, and I'll talk about this later, but a lot of them have like lung um, presets. So it tends to make the images even better. So if they have that preset, then I think it's okay. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll kind of open up the floor. Any other... Um, for, for any other questions about physics or anything like that, don't go too far in depth because I might not be able to answer it, but um, I'll pause for a second to see if there are any other questions. Nope. So we'll move on to talking about the details of image acquisition. So when we put the probe on the chest, what's our machine doing and how are we gonna make that picture the best we can possibly see? So when we talk about um, imaging the lung, we were talking a lot about how we image artifacts. And most modern ultrasounds actually have written in their, into their software a lot of artifact reduction, like speckle reduction, harmonics, and then they do compound reduction, among some other things. In the picture that I put up here, um, on the left, we have clearly a cardiac image. Without those artifact reduction um, technologies on the left, and then with them on the right, and so you can clearly see that with visceral imaging, we want that to make a better picture. But with lung ultrasound, because we're looking for artifact, we actually kind of want that stuff to go away. So in a lot of papers that you'll read, they say, you know, if you have an old machine, it's better than a new machine. But even those papers are kind of old. So I don't think that there are probably old enough machines out there to um, <laughs> use reliably for lung ultrasound more and more we're going to start using these lung protocols where they try to override 
all those um, artifact reduction techniques. So if you have that, use it um, and go from there. Or if you have an old machine, you're welcome to try it. And then specifically when we're taking a picture and looking at lung, we wanna make sure we're looking at the minimal depth necessary to see what we wanna see. So if we're looking anteriorly in the chest, we wanna just be focused pretty shallow to see the pleural line and then a couple of A lines, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then if we're looking deeper in the chest posteriorly for pleural effusion, we wanna make sure we're, we have the image settings deep enough so we can see what we need to see. Um, an important concept that I'll keep outlining during this talk is that we want to be imaging perpendicular to the pleura. And how we know that we're imaging perpendicular to the pleura is that the ribs typically appear round and not elongated or cut in, um, like more of a long axis. And then you're going to get the strongest signal from the pleural interface. So that bright white line is going to be the brightest it can be when you're completely perpendicular to it. Um, and to be able to see that really well, you actually will probably have to increase your gain as compared to cardiac ultrasound, which is typically like two to five seconds for a clip length, if we're saving images, because the respiratory cycle is longer, we'll typically make those clips longer, like five to 10 seconds, so we can see several breaths in a clip. Um, so the next part of this, we wanna talk about how we do a standardized exam. And so we talk about this in cardiac echo so that we are not missing important findings um, or being distracted when we're doing our exam. So there's an exam that we do the same thing every time so that we don't miss stuff. The most common lung ultrasound is gonna be the six zone protocol or the blue protocol. Um, I'm gonna talk about a guy um, who's published a lot in lung ultrasound, Dr. Lichtenstein, and this is his, originally his exam. So there's six fields, three per side, um, where you start imaging with the patient supine. We have an upper blue point that you can see in this image, like in the middle where that red dot is um, with the provider's hands on the patient's chest to remind you where to put, place the probe. Um, and sorry guys, if there's background noise, I've got some construction going on at the house that I just heard start up. Um, the lower blue point will be if you place your hand below your first hand um, in the middle of the palm, it ends up being at about the inner seventh or eighth intercostal space and is placed a little bit more lateral on the chest. And then there's a plaps point is the third one, um, which is basically the lower uh, blue point, but just traced posteriorly. And that, that plaps point, I always need to know why stuff means what it, or like what it stands for is postural lateral alveolar and pleural syndrome. I don't think that helps us know what it is. It's essentially where we're gonna image for a fast exam. So that's what most of us are gonna use kind of in the perioperative context. But if you go to look at you know, lung literature, there are a bajillion protocols out there that can image you know, even more than the example here of a 28 zone protocol. And those are primarily used in critical care to monitor like progression of pneumonia and ARDS. So no matter what you pick, you know, if it's six or eight, um, I think six would be the minimum, but I'd encourage people to find a standard exam and make sure you're sticking to that and doing the same thing every time, because we will find distractions when we're looking at um, patients or findings that we weren't expecting. We want to make sure we step through every, every uh, portion of the exam each time. So what are we going to see when we actually put the probe on the chest? Um, this will be the ideal image when we're imaging anteriorly on the chest. And you can see in the example patient here, um, the probe indicator is pointing towards the head. And then in the image here, we see two ribs that's dark on either side with rib shadowing below, skin, subcutaneous tissue, and in between these is gonna be intercostal tissue or intercostal muscle. And then pleura is here. So there's a bright white, very hyperechoic line. Um, and then kind of like I referred to earlier, there's enough depth on this image to be able to see what we call an A-line or a reverberation artifact of the pleura. So that would be the anterior field imaging and what we would want to see ideally. When we go to the posterior, posterior lung fields or those plaps points, it's going to be pretty similar to what we see on a FAST exam. So we want to have the probe oriented so that we can see on the right side, liver, Diaphragm is this hyperechoic line, 
kidney will be below the liver clearly. And on the left, it's similar, but we have spleen clearly and kidney on the left. And then with a patient, you know, actually on the bed, you want to make sure your indicator is um, cephalad. So those are kind of ideally what we want to see in each imaging field. So we'll get into kind of the bulk of the talk, which is which are most of the specific findings that you, we had on the first slide. But I wanted to review some pretty basic anatomy um, before we get started talking. So I want to say one one little blurb about putting the probe on the chest and talking about finding the ribs in short axis. As you image more posteriorly, you can see that the curvature, natural curvature um, of the ribs, they go essentially um, cranially. And so you may find that you need to rotate your probe slightly to make sure you're not catching too much rib and actually being able to see below them. As you get more advanced with imaging, you can actually turn the probe completely um, transverse and image just in between the chest. But I think for most people starting out, we wanna have those two ribs as kind of anchor points so we know what we're seeing. And then super importantly for a lot of the stuff that we're gonna be seeing is to go back to some anatomy and remember that there are two um, pleural linings in the thorax. So we have the parietal pleura that lines the outer portion of the thorax and then the uh, visceral pleura or that lines the lung. And so there's a potential space between these two, but a key concept um, in lung ultrasound is that typically these should be touching if there's you know nothing else in between bright white hyperechoic line that has kind of a shimmering appearance. And what that shimmering is, the sliding of the parietal and visceral pleura against each other. Um, another kind of side note is that there are irregularities in those tissues that create these little kind of hyperechoic vertical lines called Z lines um, that kind of just tell your eye that there is lung sliding there. So like, that's it, that should be it, right? Like that's easy, that's all we need to know. I would say as somebody who's done this quite a bit, it's not always that easy to see if you have lung sliding or not. Um, so I wanted to go and show you guys some side-by-side -side examples where we have and do not have lung sliding. So your eye can kind of calibrate. Similar image, top left, we have two ribs, short axis, the pleura, parietal and visceral pleura appear to be sliding against each other. So there's that shimmering component of the pleura. Um, the image below, this one here, this is through multiple respiratory cycles. And I would struggle to say that I see any lung sliding there. Um, don't see any shimmering appearance in that pleural line, even though we do still see a line there. So don't really, you know, can't really say that that lung is moving at all. And a really interesting image is the one on the right where we actually see in the same image, lung sliding next to no lung sliding. And that's a really important point that we'll get to later. But right now it's just kind of cool to see sliding on the left next to no sliding on the right. So lack of normal lung sliding can tell you that there, you know, it could be a pneumothorax, but there could be other things there. Um, you could have a patient with inappropriate ventilator settings, getting very small tidal volumes. They could be apneic. This could be, you know, a code situation without um, a advanced airway and not breathing for the patient. You could have a main stem intubation where you're not seeing lung sliding on one side or have proximal obstruction of some other kind. So absent lung sliding doesn't always mean pneumothorax. And we'll kind of come back to that and stress that quite a bit. But say you're not sure. You're like, well, I, I see the pleura, but you know, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I'm not comfortable making that call. Fortunately, um, this is where M-mode kind of comes to the rescue. So M-mode is an echo modality that we're probably all pretty familiar with. But what we're looking at is a tiny slice of a 2D image, say right down the middle here. And then over time, we're seeing that slice. So there's very char characteristic kind of artifact generated in uh, lung M-mode. Normal lung sliding is going to generate what we call like the seashore sign. So somebody at some point thought this looked like waves crashing onto a sandy beach. The sandy beach artifacts, or the sandy beach appearance is just artifact generated. And so we don't see that artifact. So we just see this, those vertical black and white lines all the way down. Um, and again, this could be pneumothorax, apnea, main stem intubation, small tidal volumes. Um, and, you know, 
rarely, but something to think about conceptually is that these people could have had pleura DCs in the past where that um, the pleura is actually fused at that location. So um, uncommon, but something to think about. So another normal finding is um, an A-line. And I kind of already mentioned this, but it's a reverberation artifact that occurs really only when that those two pleural layers, the parietal and the visceral pleura touch. Um, you'll know that they're A-lines because they occur at very regular interval intervals. So say this is two to three centimeters down. You can see that again, two to three centimeters down, you have a similar but kind of decreasing in strength signal. So because you have contact between the parietal and visceral, visceral pleura, you can say that there's nothing else there and there's no pneumothorax. So this is a normal finding, it's reassuring. Um, that you don't have a pneumothorax at that location. Another reassuring sign is something called a low of no pneumothorax. So if you sat the probe there for a long time, put on M mode, you would actually be able to see these tiny cardiac pulsations, which this little graphic very nicely um, overlaid with an EKG so that you can see in systole, you have some vertical motion of the pleura. I'll say it again, this could be main stem intubation, endobronchial intubation possibly, or it could even be like intended lung isolation. The last sign that I want to kind of get dig into is reassuring that you don't have a pneumothorax is something called a beeline and it kind of gets into more pathology. Beelines are also known as lung rockets because they create this artifact of bright white kind of hyperechoic um, artifact that transmits all the way down to the bottom of the screen. They will move with lung sliding and they will obliterate A lines is the, um, the phrase that's used a lot. They can be seen up to two in one inner space um, as a normal finding. People who are supine, sitting, kind of waiting in your pre-op bed, you can probably find this posteriorly on the chest from small amounts of atelectasis. If you have more than three though in one, inter one interstitial space, um, that's probably a pretty good sign that there's some interstitial edema. And thought to be, you know, fairly accurate. And this is another paper published by Dr. Lichtenstein. So in motion, this is what B lines look like. The top left is more of a traditional image where we have the two ribs and short axis with the plural interface um, clearly moving and with these B lines shining all the way down to the bottom of the image. Um, there is actually an A line here kind of right in the middle that you can see that the, um, the B lines kind of get rid of or shine through. And then on the bottom right is an image more in transverse. So you don't really have the two ribs and short axis. You can see sliding artifact here, and then um, kind of the rocket appearance of those B lines shining all the way down and that are, are also getting rid of A lines. <clears throat> so to reiterate, B lines mean you don't have a pneumothorax because you can only see those if those pleural layers are in contact with each other. Um, it could be a focal process like pneumonia or atelectasis and not always interstitial disease, but more likely than not, it's going to be volume overload of some origin. An interesting side note for B lines, um, a meta-analysis not too long ago looked to see how, how good is lung ultrasound at detecting interstitial edema as compared to chest x-ray. And based on this meta-analysis, it seemed that lung ultrasound may actually be more sensitive at finding that interstitial edema than chest x-ray, which is interesting. Um, that being said, this study was in the context of acute decompensated heart failure. Um, I added undialyzed and stage renal disease to this because I think that's probably an opportunity in our practice to image a little bit more. Um, and who I think of with end-stage renal disease that I want to know if they were volume overloaded is, you know, the patient that shows up on Tuesday who didn't dialyze over the weekend, who missed Monday. Um, you know, should you take this patient to the operating room? All of the things being normal, electrolytes and acid base. Could you say that they're volume overloaded or not? So it's another kind of opportunity for us to use lung ultrasound. Um, and final side note about B-lines, um, there was some pressure analysis done by Dr. Leichtenstein where he basically administered volume until patients became volume overloaded by lung ultrasound. So gave them volume until they got B-lines more than three per intercostal space, and then took the person to the cath lab and looked at what their wedge pressure was. Um, they think about a wedge pressure of 18 is when you start, first start to see B-lines. 
So that's a nice number to have in mind. So that if you see beelines, you know, you could probably say that your patient doesn't need more volume or is adequately fluid resuscitated. So to recap all those findings, do you have a pneumothorax or do you not have a pneumothorax? As one of the key questions we're trying to answer. Super unlikely if you see any of the following. Uh, plural sliding, clearly, seashore sign, A lines, Z lines, or B lines. Um, if you don't see any of these, you know, a pneumo is probably likely, but is not quite yet confirmed. There is a confirmatory finding that we call a lung point. Um, what that is, is, was kind of that interesting image that I showed you guys at the beginning where we have an intercostal space where we can actually see where there is lung sliding right next to no lung sliding. And that's 100% 100% specific for pneumothorax. And aside, if you put M mode over that, you would get both the Sandy Beach and the barcode sign, which is just kind of cool. Um, realistically, I think in practice, um, we're not going to find this lung point, nor are we going to stand around trying to go find it because sometimes they're really hard to find. Um, so it's important to think about this idea of if you have absent lung sliding and you're suspicious of a pneumothorax, how big do you think it is? And is it clinically important? So at the risk of sounding a little bit pedantic, like where does air go in the chest? Air is gonna go up. So if you're imaging your patient who's supine and you see air anteriorly, primarily, the pneumothorax, or if you see signs of a pneumothorax anteriorly only, that's likely small, right? Because that's where all the air has risen to. If you start to image more lateral on the chest, and especially if you get posterior to the mid axillary line and you see signs of a pneumothorax, you are probably looking at a large and potentially hemodynamically significant uh, pneumo. So it's probably time to do something about that. So that's not always made super clear when, when we're reading the literature. So I really wanted to take a minute to point that out. So I'm gonna transition now from pneumothorax to some other findings. Wanted to pause and see if there are any questions about any of those. You commented on uh, beelines and, and other things that have been done as far as volume overload. My understanding is that for finding pneumos, ultrasound is, is a much better technology, but it sounds like there's still a number of, of steps you're talking about going through. So. What what would put it together for you to say, you know, this person, whatever, this happened the other day to someone who was telling me yesterday they were transporting up to trauma, patient gets acutely unstable, um, and long story short, they ended up having a tension pneumo. But what, what what's going to put it all together enough for you to say, I'm going to go do a needle decompression in somebody? I'll kind of touch on that a little bit more at the end. Okay, sorry. But I think, <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. So I think, like I said, if I see signs of a pneumothorax laterally in an unstable patient, there's really kind of low risk for doing needle decompression. I think the signs are kind of pointing to all towards there's something going on in the chest at that point. Um, I don't know that, you know, there's any, any one thing. It's more just taking all of the stuff into context. There's no short answer, unfortunately. Okay, so some other specific findings that I want to touch on. Um, one is called lung hepatization, um, which is essentially just lung without air, which can be due to atelectasis is really bad, hypoventilation, which leads to atelectasis, uh, compression from pleural effusion, or focal infection. Um, but you can see here, so this is that flaps point that we talked about, probably a little bit more cephalad, uh, where we have liver, diaphragm, and then within the chest, you can see actually some hypoechoic um, area that's probably pleural effusion, and then some condensed and consolidated lung um, that ends up taking on the consistency of liver. So that's why they call it hepatization, but it can be a whole bunch of different things. The next kind of separate and pathologic finding when we talk about atelectasis um, is this concept of air bronchograms. So I said earlier that, you know, echo doesn't transmit well through air. So when we have condensed lung, it's actually able to image pretty well um, until there's air within that lung. So 
air in this lung moving actually kind of obliterates that echo signal going posteriorly. But it's important to conceptualize that we do actually see motion of air in a patient with like really bad atelectasis or um, an infection. When I think of absence or presence of motion artifact with these air bronchograms, if I didn't see <clears throat> um, air kind of moving in and out of the bronchi, I would be thinking some, something like, excuse me, like proximal large mucus plug um, or a patient maybe on like VV ECMO who has very small tidal volumes that we're not able to see. Um, and then you can kind of see that, and we'll talk about this in just a second, but conceptually it's important to see the spine back here posteriorly in parts of our images. Um, as the air moves in and out, it actually kind of obscures the, um, the view of the spine, which for like an echo nerd, I think is super cool, um, but not super important for us to, to harp on. Um, to kind of just show some other images, these pictures came from just a case report of a, a kiddo with bad pneumonia. Um, and you can kind of see this opacification in the left side of the chest on chest x-ray. Um, and then the corresponding echo exam showing on the left side, really super consolidated lung with these like sparkly air bronchograms in the chest. And so without being able to see this in motion, we don't know if there's air moving in that chest. We do know based on this that it was, it was infection in this case. We'll move on to more discussion about pleural effusion because um, that's kind of the other key part of this talk. So when we're talking about pleural effusion, we wanna think about repositioning our patient because the liquid that we're trying to image essentially in the thorax is dependent on gravity. So if you're able to kind of make your patient be more supine, your exam might be a little bit more uh, sensitive. No, sorry, not supine, sitting um, as opposed to supine. Your exam might be more sensitive in those plaps points. We want to make sure we're using a probe that's going to be able to see deep enough to actually see the effusion and all the kind of necessary components of that image. So curvilinear probe or a phased array probe. Um, and then we're imaging lateral on the chest, kind of in the mid axillary line, somewhere around the eighth to 10th intercostal space and making sure that we're able to see diaphragm and spine posteriorly. So what I'm saying I see as a pleural effusion is this hypoechoic or even anechoic region above the diaphragm. So that's liquid. The ultrasound is transmitting sound really well through there and not showing us any air artifact. Um, we also see a couple of specific, typically able to actually image all the way through the abdomen and see the spine through visceral, you know, abdominal parts. If you had air in the chest, like you normally would without a pleural effusion, you're not able to see the spine. A positive sign, spine sign means that you have liquid enough kind of liquid in the chest to be able to transmit enough echo posteriorly to image the spine in the thorax. In motion, this is kind of what an example of pleural effusion would look like. Um, so I, could, I can't tell based on the depth of the, this image, whether it's right or left upper quadrant, but you can clearly see condensed consolidative like lingula of the lung with some speckling in the middle where we have some like minimal aeration of the lung with this hypoechoic region um, above the diaphragm. This is an interesting image and I use this one because I think it's important to stress that we need to make sure that we're identifying the diaphragm so that we're not identifying abdominal fluid as fluid in the thorax. So in this patient, there's both a large pleural effusion and abdominal fluid that we see below the diaphragm. And while we can't ever say with echo, if something is like what kind of fluid, if it's transudate, exudate, or hemothorax, move freely in that liquid um, as the patient inspires and expires, as opposed to a complex or loculated pleural effusion, that's gonna have a lot of septations and kind of heterogeneity in the ultrasound um, image that you get. And then I included, I want to include an example of a curtain sign, just so we're clear on what that means. Um, so on the left, there's a patient with 
very clearly visible fluid in the thorax, um, diaphragm in the middle. You can see spine posteriorly. And as this patient is breathing, there's no motion that's obstructing like visualization of the abdominal contents as a lung actually obscure the view of the liver. And so that's what a curtain sign is. So similar to the question of where does air go, we need to figure out where water goes so we can figure out how, how big a pleural effusion is. And I think we could talk a lot longer about this, but the idea is kind of like that I talked about already, that that fluid is going to move with gravity. So if you have a patient that you're able to sit relatively um, sitting up as opposed to supine, and you look in that flaps point, and you see separation of those two pleural layers of five centimeters or more, um, it's estimated that there's probably at least half a liter in the chest. So that's a patient who is being imaged posteriorly, slightly supine. So what happens if you look and you see effusion, evidence of an effusion anteriorly? I think you've got a patient who probably just bought themselves a chest tube because there's enough fluid in there that you can actually see it anteriorly with a supine patient. Um, more quantification beyond that, I don't think there's good evidence to say exactly how much there would be in there. We had an interesting case of that not that long ago where um, you know an attending had a patient who was relatively hypoxic. Prior to getting to the operating room, um, I believe this is a, an oncology patient, um, on some oxygen, pre-oxygenated, things got a little bit better, induced, intubated, and had kind of refractory hypoxia. And they did an exam. This video is the finding um, of the anterior lung field where we can see clearly kind of this titling motion as we're breathing for the patient with the lung here at the bottom of the image and this hypoechoic line of a pleural effusion seen anteriorly. So when they saw this, they stopped the case. I feel like, you know, we see a lot of signs and signals and points and it's important to just kind of take a second, um, take it all in um, and then we'll kind of go back to some more clinical context and wrap up. Okay, I'll go ahead and move on because I, I try to be mindful of time. So we'll try to put it together in some clinical context. So, um, there are a lot of kind of um, algorithms and guidelines that you can find. I found this one kind of helpful to bring it all together. So in this example, I wanna say we have a patient who just had gastric bypass surgery. Um, now they're kind of tachypnic and hypoxic in the PACU. We wanna think about what's at the top of our differential because while I said we have an exam that we should do the same thing every time, in patients where time is kind of of the essence, thinking about what's most likely and going to image in that location first is probably going to save a little bit of time. So I venture to say in this scenario, post-gastric bypass issues in the PACU, I'm going to be most suspicious of pneumothorax personally. So I'd start with the patient supine and start imaging anteriorly. If for whatever reason you suspected hemothorax or pleural effusion, you want to start posteriorly again with that low frequency probe. Um, and then if your primary suspicion is volume overload, um, you're going to be imaging, you know, in all lung fields, but primarily anterior. So figuring out where you want to look first and then reminding yourself what you're going to see when you're looking. <clears throat> so this kind of uses some terminology that I didn't address in the talk, but there's this concept of an A-line pattern. It's all those normal findings we talked about, lung sliding, lung pulse, vertical artifacts like um, B-lines. And sorry, I'm over here on the left side of the screen. So if we see a line pattern, what we're probably dealing with with hypoxia or tachypnea probably doesn't isn't related to a pneumothorax. So we need to keep in mind that there's other things that could be happening, like asthma or COPD exacerbation. Um, they could have a small bronchial obstruction um, or have early stages of other stuff going on. And I'll kind of bring up a couple of those other things, but. I want to put out there PE and um, aspiration pneumonitis are things that we're also not going to see super early. Um, if we see fluid, that diagnosis is pretty clear. You're going to want to move to kind of get that fluid out of there, make sure it's not a hemothorax or something else going on. And then beeline patterns. I didn't get into this. There's a little bit more granularity with like what the beelines look like as, as it relates to what its etiology is. Um, it felt like too much for this talk, but just be aware that there are different patterns associated with 
um, pulmonary edema, true pulmonary edema versus like ARDS type of pathology. Um, and then the final part of this that I wanted to emphasize was the pneumothorax issue. Um, so this is a kind of pathway put together or a visual aid, if you will, for whether or not you have a pneumothorax. Um, and it starts with presence or absence of lung sliding, which, um, and I think I've driven this home, but if you have lung sliding, you don't have pneumothorax. If you see any of the other signs, the vertical signs like beelines, lung point or lung pulse, you're kind of safe. You don't have pneumothorax. Um, if you don't see any of those, technically you're indeterminate unless you see a lung point. But as Dr. McAvoy kind of alluded to, if you're in a clinical scenario where you don't see any of those things, you have a pretty unstable patient and you're pretty suspicious. If you make the call that there's a pneumothorax and you put a chest tube in, that's entirely safe and appropriate at that point, unless you have better imaging modalities at the ready. Um, but that's kind of like the clinical context that I wanted to put this in. I think the applications that we have in anesthesia um, are pretty unique as opposed to just like critical care literature that looks at lung ultrasound. So we want to be keeping in mind that we have lots of causes of hypoxia. We can detect atelectasis, edema, pleural effusion, focal consolidations and infections. We can also detect main stem and interbronchial intubation. I think it'd be cool if we could confirm one lung ventilation this way, you know, in the middle of a case when maybe your bronch tower has left the room you can check the chest and see if you have lung sliding or not. Um, clearly that wouldn't rule out endobronchial intubation in that scenario, but um, we can also try to rule out pneumothorax, especially attention pneumothorax, and then comment on a patient's volume status um, with heart failure and end-stage renal disease. And then within the critical care literature, um, they're doing some more like intricate monitoring of ARDS and pneumonia um, that we're, not clearly, we're clearly not gonna be involved in. So some of the pitfalls that I feel like we all should be aware of and that I think I've kind of driven home is that just because you put the probe on the chest and you don't see lung sliding does not mean you have a pneumothorax. You've got to go through and find all of, find the absence of all of those other signs to kind of be more suspicious of a pneumothorax. There are many case reports out there and we actually had an M&M at our institution several years ago for a chest tube placed for a main stem intubation. So we wanna make sure we keep that in mind. Um, as the patient gets sicker, this exam actually gets worse. After a central line placement to make sure you haven't created a pneumothorax that you then kind of don't detect throughout the case. Um, I have my residents do this in most cases where we have the time. And then again, keep in mind the causes of hypoxia that we don't see on ultrasound, like COPD exacerbation, bronchospasm, maybe mucus plugging, early aspiration pneumonitis, and then early PE. Um, I want to emphasize that you know pulmonary embolism clearly is a vascular issue in the early development, developmental stages of pulmonary embolism. All the lung findings are going to be normal, totally normal. Later on in a PE, when you're actually getting necrotic tissue, you are gonna find some pathology, but in our scenario, you should still be considering PE when you have hypoxia and normal ultrasound findings. And then again, keep the clinical context in mind. This is super difficult to do, especially when you're in a high stress situation. And keep in mind that this exam is dynamic. If things change, go back and you know do, do your exam again. Make sure you're doing the same thing every time and then use visual aids when you have them available. Try to keep practicing, you know, put the probe on yourself, put the probe on your patients in the operating room after you've intubated them or after you have a resident intubate them. I've caught quite a few main stem intubations that way. Um, and keep asking yourself difficult questions and practicing so that when these hard scenarios come up, you actually feel like you're capable of making a decision and impacting the patient's care. So the kind of like lame Utah related skiing analogy to lung ultrasound is that I feel like lung ultrasound is kind of like skiing in that it's super easy to get started. You can figure out how to ski pretty easily. You can put the probe on the chest and say, mm, I see lung sliding. I don't see lung sliding. 
but to get really good at long ultrasound and skiing, you really actually have to put some time in um, and make sure you're, you know, staying up to date. So that's it. It's a goodbye wave from Utah. I know it was a whirlwind, but hopefully I covered everything with some depth. So, yeah. No, that was awesome. And as always, super helpful. Um, I'll be quiet now and see if there's questions from the floor or any points for discussion. Um, I have a quick question. Um, Emily, you mentioned that long ultrasound can be more sensitive and specific than chest x-ray um, at certain things like finding pneumothorax, pulmonary edema. How experienced do you need to be with long ultrasound to reliably reach that kind of sensitivity and specificity? That's an awesome question. I actually looked for the answer to this when kind of revising this talk. Um, I don't think we have a good answer for that. Um, when you look at the ASA kind of um, point of care ultrasound, I can't remember the number for that. I want to see it's like 20 or something like that exams where we feel like you're probably okay at doing that. And Dr. McAvoy, correct me if I'm wrong, you might know that number better than me. Um, but it's not really out there. Um, there's, there's some consensus with cardiac echo, but not so much with lung echo. Yeah, I think the um, my understanding is, I mean, the POCUS program is a great one. And I know where uh, Shelly's going to be helping us and a, another team in the department getting that going here. But my understanding is they, they've tried to set a number that is reasonable, but over time we may learn more. And, but I don't, uh, you know, it's, um, you end up doing about 150 exams total, but that's split between lung, cardiac, gastric, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was going to ask a, I think Shelly asked a, everyone else has gone and, and you're putting a probe on the chest. Like, do you, is it, do you think it's 10, 20 or 50 where you, you would say just from your experience of both of y'all, I'd say to Shelly too, y'all went through the same training program, which is awesome. Like how, how many do you think it takes just to get in people's minds before, um, you know, you really do feel like, yeah, I could be confident in what I'm calling there. I would say it's kind of more in the like 10 to 20 range with the exception or like kind of with the caveat that like, you're not just putting the probe on the chest and saying, yeah, I see lung sliding or no lung sliding, like go through each of these findings in your mind so that you're refreshing kind of what you're looking for with each of those. And yeah, like 10 to 20, and you should be pretty facile at this exam, I think. I don't know if Shelly has a different opinion. I think that sounds about right to me. I mean, like you said, it's a, it's a lot more basic um, technique than all of our cardiac ultrasound. Um, but just being able to see kind of repetition, even of normal. Um, I think the, the toughest thing is finding enough examples of abnormal pathology to image so that you know what that looks like. Because um, I definitely find myself still struggling to do that. Absolutely. And you'll notice that I had to actually take a lot of abnormal stuff kind of off the internet because I don't have that many in my own like personal bank of the images. So yeah, they are, they are kind of hard to come by, but I'm going to, since I give this talk, you know, every year to the residents now, I'm going to try to accumulate more ab abnormal findings. And if you guys find any good ones in your PACU or wherever, send them to me. I'll, I'll end with a question and maybe a plea, a question for Emily, and because I know y'all's program is is really developed in a, in a plea to Shelly and our focus team. Uh, you mentioned use a cognitive aid or, or a visual guide when you can. Do you have mm -hmm. something that would almost be like a badge buddy to keep with you? Or is there something that you say, hey, here's, here's something keeping your photos on your phone sort of thing that you can pull up and so you can see, you know, A lines, B lines, you know uh seashore all, all those reminders i i don't have i don't think we have that specifically for the lung but i'll kind of hold this up it's actually right next to me because i use this to teach residents quite a bit uh it's blurred now sorry ah you can't see it let me take the blur off um anyways we do have kind of these laminated um photos of what normal findings should be and it'd be very easy to kind of add lung ultrasound imaging to this. And we have them um, on each machine for our, um, what do you want to call it? Like um, focus exam or our emergency mm -hmm. exam so that when people are in a, a hectic situation, they can kind of refer to that and make sure that, that they're looking through and imaging all the correct windows and looking for all the pathology that they should be ruling out. All right. Well, what, was, what was the plea? I forget. <laughs> <laughs> well, the plea was if we don't like, like, I think that's such a good thing, right. To have that. And so either, I guess maybe we put those on our machines or have something. Cause I think it's, um, yeah, a picture's worth a thousand words. So. 
Yeah, absolutely. And there's no, there's no downside to having a visual aid. You know, I think all of us forget things, get caught up and it might be a, in concept, like a little embarrassing and you need to use one, but I use them all the time. Um, it's very easy to forget stuff when you're in a, in a tight situation. This is one good use of Zoom, except now that it makes everybody want to go to Utah rather than staying in Nashville. So um, <laughs> I appreciate, as always, you sharing with us and um, stay well, everybody. And hopefully we will see y'all next week uh, with Dr. Beckman. I can, his talks are always uh, terrific and I can guarantee you that they will be entertaining as well with uh, some great anecdotes in them. So hope to see you next week. Emily, thanks Bye, again. Bye guys.